lastly, the one that I did with the Historical Society, Two People's One Place, was the most enjoyable to work on. Writing could be a very lonely profession. You're just sitting there, either you're, either you're in the archive, and in some archives you have to put on white gloves, and uh, it's a very kind of you know, isolated existence in the cold place so the manuscripts don't get uh, destroyed, or you're just sitting by your computer. And with the whole history, it was a project of the historical society, and I didn't have to go snooping to find stuff. People would just throw resources at me from the historical society, the Humboldt Room, the other evening, Joe, the Humboldt Room, and everybody in the historical society. Jerry Brody knows more than anybody can ever imagine, and he helped me out. And it was just a work in a cooperative, you know, and a writing project in a cooperative enterprise was just fantastic. So uh, I took, I, by that time, I had already taken up residence in, in late 18th century America. In the mid, uh, after writing a bunch of local books, I uh, kind of started working on some curriculum for, for my uh, high school uh, program, and that sent me to the American Revolution, and people say, once you get there, sometimes you never return. So I took up res residence there, but between both there, I put in some stints for the Humboldt History uh, Project, and that, that was great. Um, oh, the two books not listed there, I just wanted to uh, put a little plug. Actually, first of all, for the Two People's One Place, <coughs> Virtually the last remaining copies of, of the second printing are on that table, and Laura can uh, sell them to you today. Or Jack has some at Eureka Books, and I think there might be a couple left at Northtown. Uh, so, and after that, we have to there'll be a brief interview before Laura reprints the, reprints the two people's one place. So if you want it now, uh, and, and be aware of the new prices can be a little higher. So uh, t t today would be a good time, or go uh, visit one of the bookstores and get it there. Okay, so, uh, for, and I want to explain the title of my uh, first couple of apologies for the title. Uh, Trees and Grass. Now, if you came expecting me to talk about mystical forests and lush meadows, uh, that, wasn't what I, that wasn't really what I had in mind. As a matter of fact, I made something of a historical mistake. I thought everybody would get the reference to grass. Uh, but, but then I looked at the, uh, uh, Google has this program called Ngram. And in Ngram, they actually can calculate kind of the, the percentage usage of any term across time for the years. And it turns out the use of the word grass uh, peaked in, in, um, in 1972. <laughs> so actually, if, you, if this were a different demographic, people uh, would have gotten a reference. Because now, apparently, it's all about weed. Because you know, basically, the, 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 grass, the grass is here, and weed is practically non existent. Uh, it's 1972. And then now, it's totally the reverse. Nobody, Anyway, nobody knows grass, but maybe folks here remember the old days when we was called grass. <laughs> I guess that's more innocent than that. Um, anyway, anyway, and the other thing, uh, uh, boom, bust, and the American way. So I'm going to be talking about various, uh, various booms, uh, focusing more on, on, on most recent ones, the, uh, the Doug Fir timber boom and the, and the marijuana boom, the grass boom. So uh, let's start at the beginning, though. Let's start before, it, at a time before there were boom bust cycles in the same way. And we're talking about Native American culture here in, in the Humboldt region prior to 1850. At that time, virtually no Native Americans had ever even seen a Euro American. As a matter of fact, this is the very last place on the, in the contiguous United States where that was true, was Northwest California. Uh, to the south, we had the Mexican influence, and then eventually, actually, California was even state by the, uh, coming state by that time. And uh, to the northwest, to the north of here, you had uh, uh, Russian influence, American influence, British ships were there. But this was a pocket where that, that wasn't happening. And so before white folks came, they did have boom bust cycles, but they weren't market based. It was just nature. It was a subsistence economy. And so if the acorn crop was less or if the fish didn't run as much, that was their equivalent of a boom bust. But it was all, all determined by natural forces. They did have some uh, medium of exchange, mainly uh, the Italian shells, but these were not used to purchase things in the way that you, you wouldn't purchase acorns if you were low on acorns, that's not the way that worked. They were, they were used to settle disputes. If you had done something wrong to somebody, 
uh, I said they claimed that the grievance, for instance, you didn't offer free ferryage when you showed up by their ferry, then they could ask for uh, payment in so many Dentalian shells, the springs of Dentalian. But the boom bus cycle, uh, I mean, boom bus economy, really, well, that's all about market capitalism. And market capitalism arrived here in Humboldt in a flash in 1850, uh, when, when suddenly thousands upon thousands of, of Euro Americans descend on the area with their entire preconceived economic system, which was market based and was driven in, in a particular in the, in the quest here. Their settlement here was driven, of course, to uh, the quest for gold. And gold was the basic medium of exchange. So, that, you know, how much more uh, tied into the capitalist economy can you get? And so, we're going to actually go through uh, some of these little cycles, but I wanted to suggest some ways in which the booms go bust. And we could, you know, I'm going to kind of outline some ways, and then as we go through the, the various particulars, we can see which ones are flying. The first one, and probably the most frequent, is the depletion of natural resources, the, the, the depletion of the resource. In other words, gold is eventually going to. Get all the gold, and uh, for when it gets hard to get, you just try harder. So they, there's not much left in the rivers. What do they do? They tear down the mountains. You know the hydraulic mining. So that's uh, yeah, so the depletion of resources is one. The second large category is the basically disruption of, of the market. Market disruption. I like that term, disruption. That's a kind of a recent term in economics, but it describes so much. And so the market can be disrupted in various ways. Um, one can be a change in technology. Uh, one can be a change in computer habits or whims of the public. And the third can be government policies. Those are three common ways in which markets can be disrupted. And uh, a third way that, uh, that uh, a boom can turn bust is basically through consolidation. As, little fish, as the big fish swallow up the little fish, uh, wherever the little fish were, uh, it goes bust. And so, when, as we go through the various, uh, various little booms that we talk about here, let's just keep those in mind. Um, the first is the gold rush. And, of course, we know what they were after, and we know that eventually it was doomed to go, doomed to go bust. But when people have, when we look in hindsight at some of these, these uh, economies, and, and industries that people have undertaken, we tend to uh, kind of impose our values on them. And so now we look at, for instance, hydraulic mining and the destruction that that, that has caused, and we, look, we kind of condemn the past that way. But people at the time, when they, when they see a way to get rich quick, uh, which of course is kind of the name of the game, they tend to, they, they, they don't usually see it that way. They can find ways to really kind of like convince yourself that what you're doing is a good thing. So this is from, it's in two people's one place. You see a picture here on page uh, 107. And these, this is there's a picture, a kind of idealized picture of a, of a pioneer and a miner from Hutchings Mag California Magazine in 1857. And I'll read the caption for that. The miner, he turns the river from its ancient bed and hangs it for miles together in wooden flumes upon the mountain's side, or throws it from hill to hill in aqueducts that tremble at their own airy height, where he pumps the river dry and takes its golden bottom out. He levels down the hills and in the same process levels up the valleys and pounds the rocks of the mountain into dust. No obstacle so great that he does not overcome it. Can't do it makes no part of his vocabulary. <laughs> okay, so, you know, these guys felt proud of what they were doing. Okay. Um, well, of course, that will eventually go bust. Um, a few more uh, tidbits, historical tidbits here, from, um, from uh, bust for those times. Oh, here we go. Um, in the low, of course, the mining is inland, and, and what's a boom in the immediate humble uh, vicinity is primarily supplying the miners. And the other boom we have is for, is for the timber coming in in the 1850s. Of course, they're looking at that very easy to access regular timber. And uh, here's what, Calif uh, again, H Hutchings California Magazine from October 1858. California will for centuries have virgin forests, perhaps till the end of time. <laughs> so anyway, that's, you know, so why not make use of it for human, for human activity? And of course, uh, we'll return to this in a bit with the logging. 
There were kind of three stages of logging here. One, the first stage is what's really easy to get right around the bay, and that could be done with animal logging and basically animal power. Then the steam, steam, steam uh, engine comes in, and you get the, the, the steam with the, with the train tracks and the, and the cable logging and the steam donkeys. And then the third stage, it, but that's still limited, uh, and because a lot of uh, Humboldt County is just too, too distant, uh, too remote, geographically remote, and, and hilly for that. And so the third stage, the third and last stage, will return to later the, the uh, fuel by the internal combustion engine in the mid in the mid 20th century. Uh, back to the 1850s, here's a little uh, mini boom. Sharks, okay? From the Humboldt Times in 1857, sharks are now coming in the bay in large schools. Thursday morning, as we were coming across the bay, we saw a fleet of some 15 to 20 small boats taking shark. They were after, I guess, the, the shark oil is very refined, it's like whale oil, but very refined from machinery. Uh, so, a lot of these things, these kind of the, um, extraction things, they take a small part of whatever you're getting, and that's the part they use. They put out the rest. Anyway, needless to say, there weren't that many sharks that were going to sustain a long, uh, long-lasting industry in Humboldt Bay. So one year later, from the Humboldt Times, shark had not been as plenty in our day this year <laughs> as last. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay. Uh, agriculture. Okay, people say it's also the it's much a land rush, actually in the humble areas, it's much a land rush as a gold rush, more so. And but people weren't just into here, oh yeah, I'm gonna have my little farm and get my chickens and eggs and all that kind of stuff, that, you know, all subsistence. They were looking for cash crops. One of the first candidates was beets, sugar beets, because they 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 found out in this cool climate. Uh, the beets grow really well, and they it, they it, that seemed like a big prospect until they discovered that the the sugar beets they grow here basically didn't have much sugar. So that's the way that went by. So the market kind of disappeared, disappeared um, in, in, in an instant. Now, in the mid, like, uh, what was another core way of crop that did prosper was potatoes, and it got more and more and more. And until the mid 70s, um, in 1874-75 growing season, there were uh, 24,346 tons of potatoes produced. That's almost 50 million pounds of potatoes coming out of Humboldt. Um, now, uh, that shortly is going to go bust by the potato blight. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in other words, and if these things come, they expand, expand, expand until something sort of bursts the balloon. And in this case, it's very little. The blight just burst that balloon. Uh, during that bus, this is, a, this is a great one. This is a, uh, from Stephen Powers in 1871. If anyone has ever heard of Humboldt, ten chances to one, he has read it in the market report on of Humboldt potatoes, Humboldt spuds. Yeah. <laughs> so I get a kick out of that because now you probably any people now. Let's say you're going to say somebody, you tell somebody where you're from, to Humboldt County. Humboldt County, <laughs> wink, wink, you had it for me, you know, etc. You know, so that's it, and that's just kind of like what it's just that it's that immediate identification. So I get such a kick out of the idea that that used to be Humboldt spuds. <laughs> and another story there. Now I'm backpacking from a personal story from my own life. Um, we're going to talk more about the pot industry, of course. But in the 18, around mid 80s, which uh, was when I wrote Cash Crop, I, uh, my family's from New York, and I was back visiting them in the. And I actually grew up in Greenwich Village and Washington Square, where I used to go as a, as a teenager and play chess at the tables there and so on. Uh, these kind of shady looking characters kind of creeping around here, and then I'm, I'm going to go away from the microphone a little bit to buy some grass. <laughs> For those who didn't hear it, it's buy some grass. And they did it, they did it as, 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 as a, you know, like, so you could barely hear it. That's the point, right? So they're trying to, and I'm looking at them. You want to sell me grass? I'm from Humboldt County, dude. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my memory, this is, you guys, you guys all have memory things. I have a memory thing. Your memory is fascinating subject. But in my memory, I have no idea whether I said that or, as we say in hippie land, I simply vibed to <laughs> But uh, one way or the other, that's what I would think. Yeah, that's my, my memory, you know, uh, dude. Okay, so um, then others, uh, we go to the tan bark boom. The tan bark 
room in the back, in the back country because uh, can't, you, know, uh, you don't get much around the day, but Southern Humboldt is just loaded with tan bark. That's kind of main tree, particularly. Uh, well, it's, it's always been coexistent with, with, with fir. Uh, but before they could get the fir out, they decided they found they, they extracted the bark. They, they cut down the bark. I mean, they cut down the tree and peeled the bark. And they call it a hotter today, it's easier to peel, all this stuff. You know, there's a whole industry built up around tan bark. And then they loaded on mules, and they had, actually had an extraction plant in Priceland, or sometimes they take it to the coast and, and, uh, and send it down to Venetia where they can leather it. And that's kind of an interesting industry because now the Indians, they tan with, with, the, with deer brains. And, and when they, that's part of the whole thing. When you kill a deer, you use everything about it. You don't just use like the shark oil or you know, you, so you use the brains. They basically use the deer brains to tan the deer eye. So that's you know, kind of an intricate thing. But here you're cutting down a whole tree just to get the bark. And it kind of reminds me a little bit like, like elephant tusks. You know, you kill the elephants to get the tusks. And, uh, there's a quote from, uh, this is from one of the, uh, the survivors of local, uh, local Native Americans there. He said, Nigachio, uh, the Sintion creator, says, it looks just like all my people lying around with all their skin cut off. You know, so, yeah, it's a, that's these, these, this, this isolated kind of non-holistic industrial, you know, I mean, uh, economic system that just goes for the single thing that doesn't look at the large thing. That's very tied into the boom bust cycle. Uh, now we're moving on to the now the mid uh, basically around the 1930s the internal combustion engine really uh, uh, trans uh, uh, disrupts the well actually this transforms the logging industry in three in three ways. First of all, you have the the chainsaw instead of the old drag saws. Of course, uh, before steam, there's three. First, you have the hand. The, you know, cross cuts with the two guys up on the on the uh, spring boards there and cross cutting. They had the brass saws that could weigh 100 to like, even all the way up to 400 pounds, and they were actually tied into a steam donkey, and they used steam power to do that. And then you got the portable chainsaw in the 30s, so people could suddenly really go, you know, move around the woods pretty easily. You didn't have to uh, uh, either do it by hand or drag a steam donkey around. Then, of course, you had the caterpillar tractor. And those would build build roads to get there, and they would so, so you wouldn't need a railroad anymore. You could actually, and you wouldn't have to hire uh, crews of coolie labor anymore, which is the way roads had been built. Uh, but you could just plow the road, uh, plow the road, and then once you were there, you wouldn't need a cable system anymore. You just hack, uh, attach your log to a tractor, uh, a caterpillar, and. And, and drag it out, and of course, that on those roads become the logging trucks. All this is, is internal combustion engine. So the back, the, the, the interior humble just goes nuts for about 25 or 30 years, from the mid 70s, from the mid 30s to about the mid 60s. By the time I arrived here in 1968 from New York City, actually I've been in California and Oregon for six years, but uh, anyway, it's 50, 50 years, 50 years ago, because 2018, so I've been here 50 years. And by the time I arrived, uh, basically the, there was there used to be 25 mills in Southern Humboldt, and there was one, one left, and then that disappeared in, in, within a couple of years. So what was left in Southern Humboldt? Uh, what was left was just wasted log over land, bunch of brush, bunch of skid roads. The streams all had what they call Humboldt crossings on them. You know what Humboldt crossing is? Humboldt Crossing is basically, they, they didn't put in culverts. If you wanted to cross the stream or a gully, you just plowed a bunch of dirt there and, and, and cross it. That was it. That's Humboldt Crossing. And uh, so when the, street, this, the rains come, they might wash it out. By the, that time, you're gone and all the silt, you know, you don't care. And the silt goes to the rivers and, and all those consequences from the fisheries and so on. But uh, we, uh, we, I was part of that land movement, and, and we were looking for a better life. Uh, we were kind of start from scratch. We were coming out of the turbulent 60s in the city, in the cities, and um, a lot of us had been trying to, myself in particular, I was, uh, spent two summers in the South working on civil rights, Mississippi Freedom Summer, and I was involved in the peace movement. We were doing what we can to, you know, uh, all those picture, you know, pictures of the napalm girl, and, and our government is doing that. We all remember it probably. A 
lot of you that picture or you've seen in history books. Uh, so we wanted to start from scratch and we wanted to start from something better. And so we start flooding in. Uh, when I come here, I'm so amazed, just a uh, kid from New York, I actually didn't know what the top of a carrot looked like, by the way. So I figured that was pretty, pretty green. And I couldn't imagine, I see all these trees, and actually Bob McKee sold, sold, sold us our land, and then, you know, the develop, hippie developer from Southern Humboldt. Um, and, and he said, he would go around and start naming all the trees. I said, how do you know the names of all those trees? That was a bizarre concept for me, that all these trees had different names, and I thought it was pretty green. Uh, but I was so fascinated, I started talking to the old timers, and, and just learning more and more and more about where, and that led to my first book, Everyday History, of somewhere. Being the true story of Indians, bloggers, potatoes, fishermen, I think it's on the back, it's got a, anyway, there is, uh, uh, there's a copy on, my, my humble books, I have copies of them on the back if you want to look at them. And incidentally now, these days, any book, all books are now continuously in print through the internet. You just don't, you can get any book now. You used to they be out of print, but now you just get any used book, I'm sure, anything that attracts you, you can find. So anyway, I'm interviewing people, I'm interviewing old timers, and uh, you know, what a fascinating story I'm getting. I asked one of them, Glenn Strong, uh, has, did anybody ever live in Whale Gulch before? Well, well, where I live, describe it, okay. Um, it's, it's about three miles from the ocean. If you cut down the brush in a certain way, you can get a distant ocean view. Uh, it's about that angle, uh, nearly vertical. The only flat land on the 20 acres, uh, the only flat land was the skibros. The compacted earth on the skibros. So you're not going to grow a lot of food on that. You know, rocky soil anyway. And uh, anyway, so I asked Lance Strong, oh, I just got to mention the price. Because the price was right. The price was right. This is like, remember, it's totally depleted land. Totally depleted land. And there's not good for anything. You're taking all the trees. You can't grow anything on it. So why would anybody want to live there? And that's basically, so I asked, I asked Glenn Strong, anybody ever lived in whale bush before? Hell no. Wasn't anybody crazy enough to you folks came along? <laughs> so, but why did we go there? Because it was somewhere else, it was somewhere new, it was somewhere different, and it was cheap. Okay, 20 acres. Uh, the payments on that were 105 bucks a month. That was more than I wanted to pay. So I got two partners. So we, our, our share was 35 bucks a month. Now, now, we're, now we're in my, my range here. So that, that's our that's our land payments. And uh, Marie and I, Marie's here. We proceed to build a house out of. Uh, we get some uh, driftwood posts from the patrol of the beach up by uh, a petroleum beach and then the Cape Town beach. We get some you know, where you can drive near the beach. And then we got some recycled uh, Victorian wood when they're tearing down Victorians in the city. And uh, Marie battered her eyelashes and made friends with the guys and said, you know, can we go chop it down? We could never do that now. So we get go in there with our little hand saws and cut, cut out the roof joists and bring them up to our friend with a hippie school bus, our partner, and he grew up right up here. And then some economy uh, great love lumber from Break It and uh, put together some semblance of a house. And so this was like this was our world, and this was a lot of what a lot of people were doing. And uh, from the culture we came from, of course, it was kind of a hippie Bay Area culture, and, and this was in the 60s and into now we're in the early 70s. And um, you know, people smoked a lot of pot, so they had their Mexican weed with them, and this kind of uh, we call the swag, you know, the shape and stuff. And you had all full of seeds, and you put the you put it in a shoebox, and the seeds would drop down at the bottom, and then you smoke, smoke the rest, and the leaves and all. And uh, something said, "Well, oh, what are we going to do with these seeds?" So you put a few in the garden. Somebody did, you know. And uh, you know, the rest you can see where that's that is going. <laughs> they, they, really, they, they they don't call it weed for nothing, you know. They, they, that's for all the on the, on the grow sides in in uh, uh, in Nebraska and so on. That's it. So it gets, so more and more it gets to be a bigger deal. And, uh, and then people start perfecting it, actually. Uh, people, uh, people, after they grow it, they, they say, well, I don't have to buy the Mexican stuff anymore. I can buy my own, and you start supplying your friends. And then so, somebody says, you know, the stuff that really makes you high is actually the resin. And, well, okay, how do you get the resin? 
Well, they, they figured out that the, the, the nails don't do it. The nails are kind of worthless, so you kind of get rid of the nails, and that gets rid of the seeds, and it's just, and the female is going desperate, basically, horny as heck, and puts out on all the resin, and that sensomia, and that becomes a big thing. And so they, now you have sensomia, and then some, some people actually from Southern Humboldt are in the, in the mid 70s, they go over to uh, somewhere Thailand or somewhere over some exotic place over there, I can't remember which, and they come back with a different strain instead of uh, uh, cannabis sativa, it's cannabis uh, indica. indica. And so that's much stronger and it gets stronger. And, and you see, so, and so what's happening is you're getting more and more of this kind of Yankee ingenuity. Uh, and, and, uh, and, so you, and, and by now, things are getting really big and it becomes a big deal. And, and uh, it's, it's on the page table uh, in the early 80s. Two things happen. One is you get government eradication programs, uh, uh, campaign against marijuana production, green sweep, all these, you know, you get real cops and robbers things happening, and nothing like cops and robbers and get rich quick things uh, to attract the press. So the press comes in, the Chronicle and Sacramento Bee, and the New York Times has an article about how the streets of Garberville are lined with Mercedes. And, uh, I don't know where those Mercedes came from, but I never saw one or two, but maybe they were tourists, I don't know what they were. Um, No, no. Oh, well. I got nobody to play 
complain because I didn't publish with the New York publishers. I, I couldn't let this out of the, you know, I, I wouldn't trust them. They, they had to cover it from the Newsweek on there. So I just, we basically self-published this book, uh, which I think was the right thing to do. It caused us a little embarrassment to be mad because when I started reading it, I realized that I grammatically did not really punctuate uh, which and that, which, which, which and that has a comma and which doesn't have a comma, all that kind of stuff. And so a proof of, uh, so it's kind of like a, a New York proofreader would have caught that minor embarrassment. Uh, but I think the down home quality was worth it. So there is one, I'm going to read you a section, because this is the one section that I think is very uh, most interesting for my prediction. A lot of those things, those things that I was identifying then have really come to pass in spades, you know, really more so. And so I felt that, that actually a fairly prescient book that way. Okay, but here's a passage. This is the key passage. From a democratic point of view, perhaps the biggest failure of the traditional capitalist system is its tendency for consolidation. Small businesses continually go under, either driven out or swallowed up by their larger competitors. Even in agriculture, the family farm is no longer a viable unit. High-tech agribusiness drives prices down to where small labor-intensive farmers can no longer compete. <coughs> But, marijuana, uh, but, in marijuana, in, in, but in the marijuana industry, there are structural forces which counteract the natural tendency towards centralization. The combination of illegality and geographic isolation provide built-in guarantees against consolidation. The larger the operation, the higher the risk. So there's a strong incentive to stay small and decentralized. As the government eradicates the larger, more visible plantations, the less visible and safer enterprises enjoy a greater share of the market. Government eradication of marijuana agribusiness therefore serves as a sort of protective subsidy for small independent growers, doing as much for the cause of democratic capitalism as the Small Business Administration could ever hope to do. <laughs> Down three to one. 
See, the Illinois law is 70%, but it was like 77, upwards of 70% voting against legalization. This is from the, the culture that had, had said, how can you make this whole thing illegal? Because what's happening in the end is economic, ec, ec, economics is trumping ideology here. And you have a few of the old ones, mom and pops, my generation, saying, well, we've been voting for legalization all this time. I will vote for it, but I hope it doesn't pass. <laughs> And so anyway, that was then, 2010, and now that brings us to, guess what, 2016, and it passes, and oh my god, all hell breaks loose. And so that's, that's where we're at now, in a very peculiar, very peculiar kind of a bust here. Uh, remember the third way, the, the last way I mentioned for something to go bust was consolidation. And one before the, and then, and then another part of the market disruption was government policy. So if you look at the effect of those two, government policy, legalization, okay. Within legalization, now you have the, the, the uh, Bureau of, of Cannabis Control has, I think, 133 pages or something. Somebody said, I haven't looked at it all, on the, uh, regulations. So to, if you want to go legal, with your pot, because now it's legal, uh, you first have to get a county permit. And there's all sorts of uh, steps there you have to do. And there's all sorts of people you have to pacify, like the Water Resources Board. Uh, in certain places, you have to get Indian bylaw that you're not, uh, you're not doing some, uh, you know, uncovering some Indian sites. And there's all sorts of different agencies get involved. And, and, and hopefully, then you get your permit. Then you have to go to the state and comply with all these things to get your state license. You have to do the full uh, seed to sale. Track and trace. You have to label everything, you have to document it, how it's all done. And you know, with these 133 pages of regulation on the state level plus the county level. And this is from the people who, who basically bowed out of the whole system altogether and, and uh, never got building permits for their buildings or any green line. Truth be told, we never got a permit. I did do this, I applied for the permit, so I had a permit. <laughs> But, uh, but we were so far out in the woods, nobody ever bothered to. <laughs> so, I mean, I applied for the permit before, we, before there was any proof for it to show for it. So, uh, anyway, there's all these things. So, so are you going to go, uh, are you going to try to go and do all that stuff? Who can do all that stuff? Who can afford to do all that stuff? Well, I'll tell you, some people who can afford to do all that stuff is, for instance, um, uh, let's see. What is that? So let's name that group. Um, Scott, Scott's Miracle Grow. Scott's Miracle Grow is just investing $5 million in cannabis, uh, in cannabis products. Okay? That's a good afford to. In Sacramento, there is a, uh, there's a permit issued in Sacramento. Remember, the permits were issued by the county and licensed by the state. There's a permit issued for 1.22 million square feet, which is, 20, uh, which is 28 acres. And I did the calculations of that. The Humboldt County allows for a cottage industry, where the maximum for a cottage industry, if you want to go small and you have less regulations for that, you still have regulations, but fewer, is, is 2,500 square feet. So when you divide one to the other, you, it, you basically have, it would take 600 um, uh, cottage industries to equal that one producer in Sacramento on the permit. So you see what's happening is a combination of, of, of government, change government policy and this, this suddenly what I wrote about in Cash Crop about the decentralization as is, is the ability to control, you know, that simply no longer applies. And so with that out with those two things you know, and that, that out of the way, uh, the, the small guys are just hurting like crazy. And Gardenville is in a bit of a tailspin. Uh, people say the business is down 40 to 70 percent just in anticipation. This is after last year. What happens before, when people know a bust is going to happen, what do they do? If the price is tumbling, what do they do? They have to double their production to make the same amount of money. So last year in Southern Humboldt, basically there was twice as much production as ever, and the place was insane with, with, with uh, semis and fertilizers uh, coming in. And, uh, and, and yeah, and, and but now the word is is that there's so much on the market that, 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 that you're totally lucky if you can sell it for 600 bucks. And now it's that you know, 
the rags on the wall, people are, the small growers are petrified, and, and that's what's happening in that, in that, in that end of the industry. Uh, so it's a little bit, you know, remember how everybody was hoping, you know, uh, legalize, 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 but then be careful what you wish for. And I think of the Oedipus myth, uh, the, the Oedipus myth is basically, uh, he, he was, he was prophesied that he would marry his mother, so he did everything in his power for that not to that wouldn't happen, right? He tried to escape his fate, but of course the irony is by escaping his fate, he he uh, you know he ensured his fate, and that's and that's sort of what you know you know legalize legalize legalize. <laughs> so that's the story of small fry. Now me, uh, meanwhile you've got Scott's Miracle Grow, you've got up in here, you've got a whole new now it's legal. It's uh, it, the disruption of an industry. It, 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 there's losers and winners, and the small guys are the losers. Who's the winners? The winners are the people who have the wherewithal, the business expertise, the capital to take advantage of this and and keep going in the industry. Right? And there's a lot of attention now. It's not just smoking; it's vaping. Uh, there's a whole lot of pharmaceuticals uh, being developed. Uh, they're thinking of, in, in China. There's a there's a province in China that that's, that's uh, it has some umpteen thousand uh, numbers of, of hemp houses. You basically it's kind of like a struggle. You've kind of a dead hemp and sort of a thing that kind of makes hemp concrete. And because hemp has a lot of strong, uh, it's a strong fiber. And and the, the strength of the fiber is a whole other thing. So there's well, it's not only the the, 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 the product, you know, the, the THC. Actually, there's two different kinds. There's the THC and then what's the this medical thing that helps? What is it? CBD. CBD. Yeah, okay. And that that's and so so now if you go to the pot stores, which actually last last year Marie and I went to the Northwest and just before the getting to the border, I said, I haven't visited a pot store yet, it's Cleveland, Oregon. So right at the border on on uh, on 199, if you've been there, there's that pot store. So I can turn around, go to the pot store and see all the products, you know, and it's all the MTAC for the C B D and then there's the edibles and, and, and every little thing has its name. So there is, so, you know, boom and bust, boom and bust depends who you talk to. Uh, the cannabis, uh, the, the cannabis, the people who are investing in cannabis in the stock market are doing fine, and the local growers are, are hurting, and uh, Lord only knows who's in between. What about the environment? The one thing that happened, remember, this was supposed to be very gentle on the environment, and they just, you know, we're not like those loggers who destroyed it. Well, that was the we when we were small. But what about when everybody, when more and more people came in and came in, and suddenly you have you have all sorts of other things happening. You have, uh, diesel it starts with diesel spills because there's a lot of generator stuff happening, and diesel spills in the river. And then and then uh, the fertilizers. Now you have what's called light debt. You have indoor growing. You can get two to three three crops a year. You have light debt. You make it stronger by 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 thinking, making the crop plant think it's it, it, it seasons over. And so you, you, you have all that, and then you have like three crops a year, and every one of those crops you have to start with brand new soil because you're juicing the soil so much. That's purchased fertilizer. Where's that old fertilizer going? It's going into the, into the, the, into the water sources, and our rivers are, are, a sad, are a sad tale. The combination of that and the gravel uh, is, is pretty sad it's for our house on the Eel River. Uh, you guys uh, live in town, you've got the whole problem with indoor grows, and the problem the Problem with what's that doing to our rents and, and and what's that doing to the houses as people rewire their houses for indoors? So, you know, maybe the landlord doesn't even know that. So, there's all these kind of like societal forces driving, going that way. So, you have a big mess now. You have a boom and bust simultaneously. We are at a pivot across you know, the time. Suddenly, remember when I went to, when I first came here in, uh, in 1968 or whatever, and I started. Talking to the old timers, and I said, "Sorry, yeah." He said, "Who should I talk to?" Well, all the good ones just died, <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, but I found a bunch that seemed pretty good to me. <laughs> and then I went out. And somebody said, "You got to talk to Guy Curlis. Guy Curlis. He's the old tra trapper, you know, from uh, from Home Slatter up in that area. That, he's the best story of teller in the mall." So I go up there, and uh, uh, it takes me half a day to get there from way out in the hills, and I get it, and I tell my, my technique, which is, you know, I'm going to take record it, and then I'll show you everything so you can decide what, what you like. And he just says, nope. <laughs> Man, a few words, 
accept when they you know, shoot some up. And I'm, nope. And I said, well, why not? He says, some of the people are still alive. And that was it. <laughs> Never did get fireproofless. But he did talk to somebody because fireproofless tape is in your you know, old timers thing. And, and my son Nick uh, 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 took a finger off his hand because he was an old timer before his time. And he was missing a finger and he couldn't do anything uh, working in the woods, which he did all his life until he died at age 26. But, but he was at, he, he went out there and with his left hand, he listened to those guy curlist tapes from your old time reflection and took notes for me for, my, for the two people who spoke. <laughs> anyway, so this old timer, so the reason I'm telling the old timer story is because guess what? I'm an old timer now. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been here 50 years. I wrote the book Cash Crop. So now everybody's coming for us and they're not doing books, they're doing videos. <laughs> they come through. Well, we want to get you on the tape for your video for Cash Crop. Yeah, for it. Because they're going to document it. Because it is a very dynamic time. You know, it's a very dynamic time. We don't know exactly where it's going to be. You're, you guys are all in the middle of it in your own way just by living here. Uh, and uh, so there, there it is. There, you know, I'm, I'm that old time. And actually, right now, I'm sort of facing the thing. There's this group that came in, and they want to do the thing, but they were going to focus on these five missing people, and it sounds like they're this whole crime thing. And do I go with them, or do I go with, with people, local people who are trying to do it? Anyway, that's my little business. But uh, anyway, that's kind of where we are from the way I see it, right at this pivotal moment. And I thought maybe we'd have a few minutes to open it up for some interchange. Uh, there's uh, or, or stories that you all have from your own lives or just issues like where where, where do we take this thing? Yeah. And so you have to report on your income taxes. 
But unlike any other business where you subtract your expenses, you don't get to subtract your expenses. So it's, it's huge. So, so you're getting taxed without any deductions. When, when a version of this happened in Washington, uh, in which we supposedly would learn from but don't seem to have, uh, it basically, um, the first 50% of your first half of your crop was, uh, of, of your income was taken up by, by, by uh, taxes and regulatory and, and satisfying regulatory. So right away, any illegal person is going to be able to uh, sell at half the price. Uh, but then there's the problems of staying illegal. These were all big, you know, how does it come down? I don't know. Those are the, those are the variables. It's a great question. Yeah. Who is buying? Is there a hint of domestic demand still? Boy, that's the, yeah, that's the, that's the question nobody seems to be able to answer very much. Um, uh, the, and it depends who you talk to. California does account for uh, the lion's share of the domestic, you know, market in terms of, you know, shipping to other places. These other places are. People are expecting that all sorts of, in, in, people, particularly in Humboldt, they're expecting all sorts of tourists to come and stock up. And they, what they're really hoping is that they're going to come to Humboldt to get the real stuff, like, you know, the wine country stuff, and the designer brands. And so uh, you're going to see all sorts, you, you, you think you've seen enough of Humboldt, the word Humboldt now with pot. Every, and now probably, but is Scott's, is Scott's Miracle Grow going to develop a brand with the name Humboldt on it? You know, you know, how's that going to be? But, but who is mine? And that's my big question. And, and Marie says, Marie says that, uh, that it's not like wine where you can drink five bottles of beer, five bottles at dinner with all your friends of the highest wines, you know, the $100 wine. I mean, how many joints can you smoke? You know, this high quality designer thing. But then that's offset by how many people are smoking them. You know, and, and, uh, no answer to that, and everybody's conjecture. God only knows. It's kind of exciting in its own way to, to see, you know, it, usually, you know, to, to see history happen with so many variables, and, and it's kind of so serious, it affects so many people's lives, and we're kind of like in the middle of the story. And by the way, a lot of us are kind of a, getting on in age and so on, and, and these sort, sorts of things, are an incentive for us to to, to, to end, end the book. We, we don't want the book to end. I mean, our lives end without reading the end, right? <laughs> so um, you know, that's that's just true for a lot of our troubled times now. For you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, where, where is this long arc of history going to come? You know, we're all looking for the long arc of history to maybe uh, you know kind of like get us a little bit more at ease with with, with just what's happening in the world, and maybe things will settle down. You know, will we be it? Then. I mean, will we make it for that to happen? Will we see the end of this pot thing? Yeah, maybe just one more question, yeah. Given your success as a historian of sage, um, what might you see as, a, as the next possible boom? Or humble kind of Well, that's a good one. I mean, people are saying that it's going to be, oh, but on some level, I think, I think there will, I don't know how boom it will be, but on some level it will be kind of eco-tourism, pop tourism. Uh, that is going to happen, the level of which it will happen, I don't know, but that is going to be something that's not going to happen. One thing that, that we have predicted for a long time, uh, Marie and I, that doesn't seem to be, that there's a counteracting force, was we thought the boom might be the aging baby boom population. People just want to live here because it's a li livable environment. Unfortunately, one thing that's working against that now is the scarcity of medical care and how difficult it is. Also, a lot of people nodding their heads on that one. And if we could solve that one, that would be quite a boom because this is a very livable place to live in. So that's the best I can say. Anybody got any, any, any other answers to that question? Uh, we're all waiting. Yeah, I'll answer me. Yeah. Why do you answer that as female doctors? It is the women. The wives who don't like it here, the doctors are fine. Oh yeah. Okay. Listen. That's great. I, I want to close. It. That's a great one to go out with. But I want to close with one more advertisement, uh, which is that uh, uh, what wasn't on this list of books is my two latest projects, uh, which I want to mention. Uh, one is, I was, just, I was just very happy we were retiring and not having any more books when a week later after I announced that, uh, my publisher uh, from New York said, can you please annotate the Constitution? We really need 
need it now. And so, so I did that. And so if you go on the net, look at my name, it's called the U.S. Constitution Explains Clause by Clause for Every American Today. So, um, and so I did, I neglected to bring a copy because I was thinking humble, 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 like all my humble books. Like, it's just a, it's a little vest size, book kind of about, just a little smaller than your menu there. So it fits in a, yeah. not a pocket, not, you know, but a jacket pocket. Uh, and it's handy. And I really get into, you know, I've been, I spent 20 years of my life getting into the town here. I'm always really happy then. And, uh, and the, the simplistic things that people see, the way the Constitution is cited just aren't really that way. So if you want a very easy explanation of the Constitution, I really highly recommend it. And it is topical. For instance, I do explain the enumeration clause of the Constitution, which you might have known about, um, and, uh, and why they did it. And why they actually said it, it, the only place in the whole Constitution where they use in any manner whatsoever. I mean, you're not supposed to accept a gift of enumeration or in any manner whatsoever <clears throat> like that uh, to, to erase yourself on the Constitution. I mean, it's, but I do this across the board. It's not a political track. I'm not going after anything other than really saying what it was then and what is this now. And then uh, after that, actually, the very next day, Barnes and Noble calls up and wants Marie and I to do a biography of Hamilton, oh. a short biography of Hamilton because of the popularity of the play. And not everybody wants to read sure now 730 page uh, uh, a volume. So Marie and I have completed that, and that's available only at Barnes and Noble because they, they have it on their sale tables, so they can sell it cheaply. So, anyway. so those, those are my product my product uh, placements. Thank you so much for watching.